The National Hispanic and Latino Mental Health Technology Transfer Center was established to develop and maintain a collaborative network to support research development and dissemination, training and technical assistance, and workforce development for Hispanic Latino populations and communities receiving mental health services throughout the U.S. mainland and the Caribbean. We offer free technical assistance. If you want more information, please contact us. The National Hispanic and Latino MHTTC is under the direction of the Institute for Research, Education and Services in Addiction, IRESA, and housed at the Universidad Central del Caribe School of Medicine in Puerto Rico and supported by the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, SAMHSA, of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. As mentioned, the Mental Health TTC Network is funded by SAMHSA. SAMHSA strives to reduce the impact of substance use and mental health disorders on U.S. communities throughout its programs and services and demonstrates that behavioral health is essential to health. Prevention works, treatment is effective, and people recover from mental and substance use disorders. You can learn more about SAMHSA by visiting www.samsa.gov. And now our moderator. Today's webinar is titled Cultural Humility, Where Being Human Matters in Serving Others. So I'm going to introduce our presenter. Our presenter is Dr. Miguel Gallardo. Dr. Gallardo is a professor, a professor of psychology and director of Aliento, the Center for Latino Latino Communities at Pepperdine University. Dr. Gallardo has published refer Refer journal articles, books, and book chapters in the areas of multicultural psychology, Latina Latino psychology, ethics, and evidence based practices, cultural humility, and racial colorblindness. He is currently a series editor for Cognella Academic Press Advances in Culture, Race, and Ethnicity book series. Dr. Gallardo is currently director of research and evaluation for the multi ethnic collaborative of community. Agency MECA, a nonprofit organization dedicated to serving monolingual Arab, Farsi, Korean, Vietnamese, Cambodian, and Spanish speaking communities. Dr. Gallardo served as a six year governor appointed licensed member of the California Board of Psychology, is currently serving a five year appointment on the Clergy Misconduct Oversight Board for the Roman Catholic Arch Archdiocese of Los Angeles. Dr. Gallardo is a fellow of the American Psychological Association. Aside and minimize me so I don't have to look at myself this whole time that I'm talking to everyone. Um, hopefully folks who are on the computer can see me uh, and um, have that uh, opportunity. I'm gonna share my screen here um, of my presentation uh, so that you can see that a little bit better. Uh, today so um you know we i'm going to try to keep uh track of time here because i know i have you know about 50 minutes or so at this point um so first off thanks for uh for joining this morning and or this afternoon wherever you may be located uh and you, you know I, I titled my presentation where being human matters and serving others because uh the, you know i think at this moment in time um you know not only in the united states but i think just around the world uh, you know, we are dehumanizing people, um, you know, daily, uh, weekly. Uh, you don't have to look very far to, to see the, uh, the atrocities that are happening uh, to communities uh, all over the world and, and certainly here in the United States. And so I, I, as, as someone who is a psychologist and um, who provides services, who trains students, et cetera, uh, I think it has become uh, even more critical to examine what our responsibility is um, as providers, as uh, professors, uh, whatever role we may be playing as human beings, really, first and foremost, in making sure that we're um, taking care of one another. And, and so I'm going to try to argue today, and, and hopefully not too much, hopefully for, for, for many of you, this is an affirmation of how you already see the world and, and the work that you already do. Uh, and, and maybe for others, it's helping you think about some things a little bit differently and, and certainly what our role can and should be uh, in serving others. Um, and so I'm gonna try to really um, talk really more broadly about some of those issues, not a whole lot about the how-to 
you know, I'll give you some uh, definitions of cultural humility and a little bit of the research that's coming out around cultural humility, just so that we have some context. Um, but I really want to make this a larger discussion around what this whole notion means in many ways. Um, you'll see on my opening uh, slide here that um, I have this a statement or this um, this image, no human being is illegal. And, um, and I think language and the language that we use certainly has a lot to do with how we see people, how people see themselves. And, and so I think one of the first things that we need to be mindful of um, both as people and, and as, as professionals is the language that we use to describe uh, people, those who we work with, those who we don't understand uh, in many ways. What's, what's fascinating to me is that we are as impacted by what we are not told as maybe even more so by what we are told. Uh, and so th there, therein lies some of, I think, our challenge uh, and, and in terms of really uh, starting to examine um, our own process, if you will, in, in trying to um, implement what this whole notion of cultural humility means. I think it's also important, I have this slide here, um, every presenter, everyone who talks about these issues, you know, we're coming from a particular lens. They're, they're, nothing is value free. So, you know, let me just make that very clear. Nothing is value free. Everything is value laden. And certainly how I'm talking about these issues today are, 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 are driven and derived from my own values, which are impacted by all these different social identities that you see here uh, about who I am. Uh, I think, uh, you know, I have this in the, in the middle here, what I see could be me. Um, and, and I think that really reflects this notion of seeing our connectedness and my value and seeing connectedness across human beings and myself and others, no matter who we are and where we come from. Uh, I'm, I, Catholicism, uh, in many ways, provides a, a foundation for, you know, who I am and, and sort of how I see the world. Um, uh, a husband, a father, a son, being privileged in many ways also impacts, um, you know, how I see the world. I'm certainly more privileged today than I ever have been in my life. And that impacts um, the, the, the freedom and the luxury in which I have to either see these issues or, um, you know, not see these issues uh, on some level. I do not have to worry, um, you know, on a daily basis if my, uh, my spouse um, or my uh, my parents or my in-laws are going to be deported or going to be, um, you know, um, sent back to our countries of origin, if you will. And that's a privilege, whereas many of the folks that I work with um, in many ways do not do not have that luxury. Uh, in fact, there have been people that I have served clinically over the past several years, uh, and some of them have unfortunately within the past year or so, uh, have been deported, uh, and so the impact that that has on families uh, and 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 the individuals is profound, and that is something that I personally don't have to contend with on a daily basis. That's so close to me, and so that's a privilege. Uh, I have many privileges. Uh, Mex I'm Mexican American. Uh, I'm, I'm heterosexual. I'm an oppressor. Uh, if I'm if uh, if I as much as as I'm conscious, I also uh, unfortunately continue to unintentionally at times oppress. I also am uh, uh, on the oppressive, on the oppressed end of things at times in many ways. Um, so all these different variables deeply impact um, how, who I am. Growing up in Texas has deeply impacted who I am and hearing stories of my parents, particularly my father, and then having my own experiences have impacted that. So I think it's important that I situate myself in these discussions um, so that uh, so that you know at least in some ways what's guiding uh, really my discussion with you today. So remembering who we are and building relationships. I, I like this quote by Cesar Chavez: "The fight is never about grapes and lettuce; it's always about people." Uh, and so I, 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 you know, when I think about not only just us as human beings, but also in particular our work, uh, I, I, I worry sometimes that we that we are. Um, uh, we get caught up with, uh, you know, bells and whistles, things that shine, things that glow in the dark, if you will. Uh, and, and what I mean by that is I think we get focused on interventions and treatment strategies and, you know, what works and what doesn't work. While all those things are important, and I'm not necessarily minimizing those things, 
I worry sometimes though that we're trying to demonstrate and prove our worth uh, in some ways uh, of, in terms of our legitimacy and who we are as professionals in the work that we're doing in 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 and in, in, in doing so at times I think we forget about that you know um, what the people the human being if you will and also forgetting that we are human beings and we are people in our work and so this this notion of intersecting who we are as people with who we are as professionals is fundamental uh, in my perspective uh, to being successful for particularly I, I'm particularly talking about working with those who are most uh, disenfranchised and most oppressed and, and and who are maybe living from week to week month to month etc so I'm not talking about necessarily um, you know in, in general middle class upper middle class folks I'm talking about um, you know, working poor individuals uh, who uh, maybe our services have not necessarily availed themselves successfully to serving them. Uh, and, and, and so that, that's really who my focus is in many ways today around uh, meeting the needs of those individuals. Not that the other groups of individuals and other socioeconomic statuses do not matter because they do, nor do, is what I'm talking about, uh, you know, can be applied there because it absolutely can. Um, but my focus in particular is, is, is remembering those whose voices are often silenced and, and um, you know, who are disempowered in society. And so we, uh, what, what, what can we do um, to uh, uh, facilitate a different process and outcome for them? And so people matter, human beings matter in our work, um, in everything we do. I recently saw a Marriott Hotel uh, TV commercial. I, I, I have no investment in Marriott, so uh, there's no plug here and I get no benefit from supporting Marriott. But uh, it said, wouldn't it be great if human beings were great at being human? And it, it was profound because I, I, I feel like, um, I, I see, I, while I see some of that happening today in ways that it, have, it has not happened in the past, I also worry that, you know, as I mentioned earlier, that we're dehumanizing people uh, and, and, uh, and in doing so, um, uh, you know, invalidating the very existence of, of who people are. And so, you know, Isaac Prilitensky has argued that wellness cannot flourish in the absence of justice and justice is devoid of meaning in the absence of wellness. And so it really begs the question, you know, to what degree are we helping people through solely intervene on an individual level while knowing that many of the issues clients bring to our offices or co community uh, contexts, wherever it may be, are situated and layered within those communities and contexts. In essence, socially derived, socially produced, uh, if you will, and, and I'll come back to that in just a minute. So I, I think we have to, it's not that individual services are not effective and, 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 and that we shouldn't provide those. I provide individual services, um, you know, every week I provide individual services. Every week I'm also doing community-based services, but even when I'm providing individual services, the context and the community in which the individual exists in and resides in and is situated in, is located in, absolutely matters in, in the work that I'm doing. Uh, and so to remove them from that or to, um, to, to not include that in my work in some fundamental critical way, I think is a disservice not only to an individual, but also to, the, to me as, and the work that I'm doing. There's a book that came out not too long ago, a, a New York Times bestseller um, by Sebastian Younger, um, and it's called Tribe on Homecoming and Belonging. I liked the book, it's a short read, quick read actually so if you've not read it I, I would highly encourage you picking up a copy to take a look at that um, but but he essentially is just reminding us you know uh, you know for thousands of years you know he, he reminds us that humans lived and worked side by side sharing resources and really in many ways protecting one another um, and what he's what he states in his book is this there's this irony and you know the more affluence that we have as a society which does bring uh, certainly other resources like safety and stability, uh, still leaves a lot of those individuals in those communities with poor psychological health. We have we know from psychological research that as wealth goes up, suicide and depression rates tend to also rise. Uh, he cited this study on uh, that examined urban North American women and rural Nigerian women, and found that the suicide rates were highest in the wealthiest of those wealthiest of those communities, which were the urban North American women. Actually, uh, he he you know he stated that in the study stated that the the, the more the lower resource the poorer the society was, 
the more collaborative the society needed to be uh, to be of the benefit of its survival. I always remember my father telling me, um, you know, growing up uh, with very little, and he says, you know, I didn't even know we were poor until someone told me we were poor. Uh, and I think that really is such a a, a, um, a critical, fundamental, powerful statement in many ways to, for us to be thinking about in terms of our work, because um, that this th there's something. Sometimes the happiest times uh, 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 for some of our communities and family members is not necessarily tied to having more money. Well, that's important and more resources, but the, but but to to assume that um, because people are low resourced does not mean they don't have strengths and resilience and resources. I think is is quite um, uh, um, is quite a, a misinformation for us to 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 internalize and to be thinking about. It's quite the opposite, actually. I would say certainly we need to increase access and resources, et cetera, to communities. But um, communities, just because uh, they may be on the lower socioeconomic spectrum of the uh, socioeconomic status um, uh, continuum. Uh, does not mean that they don't have strengths and and resilience and and that there's not a benefit uh, in, in inherent within their communities. I think you know our narrative somehow seems seems to paint a different picture, and I worry because those communities are more vulnerable and more accessible to the to the the outside observer, whereas communities of wealth and affluence are metaphorically, symbolically, and literally even more closed in protected behind walls, behind gates, et cetera, uh, that we're not seeing the issues there when the issues certainly lie there um, uh, to a, maybe even to a larger degree than maybe we think they do in other communities. So I think we have to shift and continue to shift that, that, that process. I, I worry when, when providers um, both of services or even in faculty tell me that our involvement in social issues, those social issues is not our place. Um, you know, I, I would even say that that these are not, you know, these are not. Uh, I think when we start talking about social justice, people start to, you know, they worry in, in some ways, or they 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 they're not sure what to make of that. These are just human human rights, uh, human issues, if you will, that that pertain to um, the work that we do and who we are as people. Uh, and so to assume that our connection to and our involvement in those processes. Um, is is not our responsibility. I think is a disservice. Uh, Aristotle, um, you know, believed that humans were political, or that we are political animals. One interpretation of that 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 statement and, and that comment is this that this notion that it, it is impossible for us to remove ourselves from the context in which we find ourselves. So when I say when, when, when I think my interpretation of Aristotle's polit being us being political animals as human beings is this notion that um, I'm not talking about whether you're Democrat, whether you're Republican, independent, you know, whether you're out marching in the streets, etc. I'm talking about recognizing who we are in the context of, of where we find ourselves and how that may be impacting us and certainly impacting those who we are serving. And so to assume that we are not political beings uh, I think is is certainly um, uh, uh, a false assumption, a false statement, if you will from my perspective, and I think certainly others would argue that as well. So this notion, if, if you're human, you are political. If you're a psychologist or a, a, a case a nurse case manager, a social worker, whatever your role may be, you are human and therefore you are political. So we, we need to carry our degrees and, and capacity, licenses to practice, whatever it may be, in one hand and the most recent news issue in the other in everything that we do. Carlson, states that our new charge must be to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. Uh, it is too easy for us, and I'm arguing that regardless of who we are and regardless of what social identities we uh, resonate with us and reflect who we are, we still are being challenged by the world and the context in we exist in. Just because I'm, I'm Mexican-American does not does not remove me from being impacted from the information that I'm receiving and, and that that's not going to impact my own biases, limitations, blind spots, et cetera, in, in the work that I'm doing. And so it the more privileges I acquire in my life, the easier it is for me to become comfortable. 
Uh, and so I have to be intentional about being un making sure that I'm, I'm not getting too comfortable in what I'm doing. Doherty stated that the task of the mental health provider is to be citizen therapist. He states that all clinical problems treated by therapists are thoroughly interconnected with the larger public issues, but the public dimensions of psychological problems and the civic action that could be appropriate to take don't appear in our treatment manuals. And I'm gonna come back to that, that's important. So this idea that you know we need to intersect who we are as people in the world with our work in, in a meaningful way to help those uh, who, are, um, who are suffering, if you will, in many ways, particularly as we think about what's happening now today. So let me just quickly define cultural humility. Um, when I think about cultural humility, I'm reminded of Audre Lorde who, who said there's no such thing as a single issue struggle because we do not live single issue lives. Nobody has ever just been Latinx. Nobody has ever just been Mexican, Mexican-American, Cuban, Dominican, whatever it may be, a, wom a woman, a man, gay, lesbian, whatever whatever uh, social uh, identity and, and uh, that we uh, you know identify with and, and, and see ourselves through, um, it's not just any one thing. Uh, and so this notion of intersectionality and understanding the multiple um, ways in which identities intersect and impact people's lives is fundamental uh, to, to sort of our work at this moment in time and should be going forward. So cultural humility has been defined as this, and it was, it was defined by Turvalon and Murray Garcia back in 98, particularly for medical professionals actually uh, in their work um, as physicians. And so this notion of cultural humility has been defined as a lifelong process of self-reflection, self-critique, continual assessment of power imbalances, and developing mutually respectful relationships and partnerships. Um, it's been more recently also kind of broken down in, in, into different as, uh, facets or tenets, if you will, um, that involves a lifelong motivation to learn from others. Uh, again, cri critical self-examination of cultural awareness, interpersonal respect, um, developing partnerships that address power imbalances, and an other-oriented stance open to new cultural information. I, I was recently doing a, a podcast with um, Dr. Vivian Chavez from San Francisco State University, and we were talking about this notion of cultural humility. And you know, she she said she was talking to me about her work, and and as we were talking, she said, you know, it's about being witness to ourselves from the inside out, and that we cannot force and for someone to want to be culturally humble, if you will, or to want to have an ongoing lifelong process of self-reflection, self-critique and learning, understanding and being open to new cultural information, but that being witness to ourselves uh, from the inside out is critical and fundamental to that. Um, and in some ways, having exposing aspects of ourselves that maybe make us vulnerable in the work that we're doing. Um, and, and that's important, I think, when we think about serving uh, those who are um, uh, most uh, unserved, if you will. So, you know, some of the research, just briefly, there, there's certainly more research coming out. I think one of the critiques around cultural responsiveness, cultural competence, cultural humility, all these different concepts that we talk about, which certainly intersect and have, I think, overlaps in, in some aspects of their definitions um, from one to the other. Um, but I think the critique has been, how do we measure that? How do we, how do we, you know, understand that and what that looks like? And so there's been some, you know, uh, research that's come out. There's a cultural humility scale that was developed, uh, which is a quantitative measure that um, looks at client report uh, design, uh, allowing clients to talk about their own self -percep perceptions of their therapist and their therapist cultural humility, which I think has yielded some very promising um, results and, and aspects. So really, I think the other part, I think, of our uh, research historically in cultural competency and cultural responsiveness and humility uh, is that a lot of it has become, you know, it's been really self-report of the therapist, if you will, and which we know has limitations. All, all research has limitations, but I think incorporating clients more in assessing and talking about and understanding what this can look like, I think, is, is uh, a promising aspect and one that has been missing. And all this and some of this more research that has come out recently, um, certainly it has demonstrated that, that you know, the more we as therapists are implementing what, what clients perceive to be as culturally uh, humble, uh, you know, 
practices uh, has been found to be associated with stronger therapeutic alliances um, in our in our in our work, and also maybe an increase in in um, outcomes in therapy. So so let me talk a little bit about um, you know uh, isms uh, and 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 you know why they still matter and why race still matters. Uh, I'm going to talk, uh, you know, certainly about race and racism, um, but I think what I'm not because I think it's necessarily more important uh, or, you know, than some of the other isms, sexism, um, you know, homophobia, heterosexism, et cetera. But but really because uh, it's certainly an area that I think we are we, we are struggling with and have for a very long time. And I feel like many of the issues that we're continuing to struggle with. Um, continue to reflect some of the same things that we've struggled with for 30, 40 years now, at least at this moment in time. And so I want to talk about that a little bit, and I, I will touch on some of the others. I think what I'm talking about will certainly apply uh, to some of the other isms that you that we, that we see happening in the world today. I, I think this is important because I'm really trying to, again, go back to helping us witness ourselves from the inside out. So where are we today? Well, if we think about where we are today, um, you know, uh, you know, I love this, the, the, the picture on the right, the time issue uh, of, you know, uh, the United States in 1968 slashed out 2015. And then we have the uh, time, uh, uh, you know, cover on the left, Black Lives Matter. Um, and, and so I think, you know, that really, I think, captures in many ways and juxtaposes these two images side by side, but also the issues that we're facing. Uh, you know, we certainly um, this notion of historical trauma, both for African American communities, but also you know um, Native communities, uh, and also Latino Latinx communities. I think is very much uh, present today. People are being re-traumatized today uh, on a daily basis. Um, while while this this the sign on the left, no dogs, no Negroes, no Mexicans. Um, you know, while we may not necessarily overtly see some of those signs, uh, you know, today, although I would, we still see them popping up in different forms in different ways, the fundamental um, mentality and ideology continue to exist in many ways. And then we have the, you know, the illegal immigrant hunting permit um, on the right hand side. And, uh, you know, again, trauma. Triggering, re-triggering, um, you know, trauma, traumas in our lives, if you will, and so these are these these are certainly, I think, um, worldviews that we have seen today um, happening. People always ask me when I do presentations, like if, you know, um, you know, when Trump goes away or Trump is, you know, um, no longer president of the United States, you know. Do I think, you know, do I think he's the issue and are things? Well, you know, the, the reality is, is that, you know, we were not living in, in you know, euphoria before Trump. Uh, we, you know, the life was not necessarily, um, you know, um, roses and, you know, um, lollipops and whatever. You know, I mean, it, it, we did we were not, you know, uh, the world was still in, in struggle. You know, is is our current administration helping the situation? Absolutely not. Uh, are things becoming more challenging? Absolutely. Are people, you know, feeling like they have permission to uh, engage in ways that that they haven't historically? Uh, absolutely. And so, uh, I certainly think we are seeing things today in ways that we haven't before. Um, but these issues have been present in many ways. Um, what are the implications of one fully expressing themselves or our beliefs, if you will? Um, and 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 what what does that mean? And, and how does that you know um, how do we respond to those issues when they come up and or support or stay on the sidelines and not say anything um, for fear of what that may mean uh, in terms of our own process and our own selves? So what 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 does it look like to be traumatized and re-traumatized? Well, I mean you know just some brief examples. You know we have the hashtag Me Too movement and you know um, a few quotes here. Uh, around you know uh, women's experiences of of that these things these issues dehumanizing sexual objectification uh, uh, vi boundary violations have existed generations uh, and you know and so this is not a new issue uh, it's certainly one that I think is getting some uh, time and attention in a way that maybe it hasn't in a while and I'm I'm happy about that but it doesn't necessarily mean that this is new. Um, but it's it's an issue that is traumatizing and re-traumatizing uh, to women. Uh, Black Lives Matter, which I just mentioned. I mean, you know, look, you can find examples of these 
situations, uh, you know, there's hundreds and thousands of them that you can pull up that are happening uh, on a daily basis. And then gun violence, you know, I mean, we talk about Parkland, Sandy Hook, et cetera. You know, I, I and, and I always, I always, you know, I want to be very mindful when I talk about this and respectful. Anytime we lose a life, I don't care what the background is of the individual, white, rich, uh, whatever it is, uh, brown, black, not rich, what it it's a travesty. It, it's a it's a it's a it's a it, it impacts us as human beings, regardless of who the individual is. So so it's not that I don't see that we need to be responding to these types of uh, issues that are happening with regards to gun violence and some of the settings in which they've occurred. But my concern is, is that in communities of color, routine gun violence, uh, I mean, uh, gun violence is happening disproportionately on a daily basis, weekly basis. In fact, at the March for Our Lives um, uh, event that happened in D.C., I remember listening to Edna Chavez, who's from here in L.A. and South Central, and she made this very profound statement. She said she learned to dodge bullets before she learned how to read a book. And so, you know, so when I think about these messages, in some ways, we prioritize certain lives over others. And 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 I think we are certainly seeing that in, in ways, um, in overt ways that we haven't before. Again, any loss of life is not is not OK. But I want to always try to try to try to kind of position these things. Why are we all of a sudden responding when these things are happening on a daily basis uh, and what are we doing about it? What role can we play as 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 mental health individuals in addressing these issues? I, I also have, you know, immigration. Um, I have a the top of my slide says help wanted, no Irish need apply. It, you know, we forget our history here in the United States and we have not done a good job of remembering that. Um, uh, Irish, Italians uh, were immigrants to this country and uh, uh, discriminated against in high numbers. It's it's now Latinx individuals, you know, Middle East folks from the Middle East, et cetera. But uh, we are repeating these processes over and over again in, in our in our in our communities, in our societies. And and to say that we as as professionals are not being impacted by these processes I think is is um, uh, is 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 not accurate. Here's the th here's the deal, and here's what I want to here's what I want to argue for is that, you know, Bonilla Silva would Silva would say that when we when we just focus on these overt actions like you know the things that we see happening, the the demonstrations happening, and the the conflict happening there, or the you know these overt acts, you know, it, it, people it's too easy for people to say that only happens over there. Or, um, you know, it's only in, you know, Alabama where that happens. It doesn't happen here in Southern California or what, what and no offense to Alabama. I'm just, you know, making a comment or, or, or South Carolina or whatever it is, or, you know, it doesn't happen, you know, here that that's a false assumption. So it, it, it's too easy for us to distance ourselves from those particular issues when we only focus on those overt racial events and situations, it legitimizes an erroneous conceptualization of racism. Uh, and it, it really, he would argue, clouds our effort to bring to the fore discussions about how race matters in everyday life. Uh, and it also helps us sustain this notion that we're no longer racist in the United States because those are simply isolated incidents. The problem with that is that it does not allow us to conceive of racism as systemic institutional. Uh, in some ways, it, it even unintentionally positions us to sort of this good people versus bad people, the Trump supporter versus the non-Trump supporter, the, the racist versus the non-racist, the Democrat versus the... It sets up this us versus them, whereas if we situate ourselves and we believe it's a national systemic problem, it's like the air that we breathe. Basically, racism, sexism, heterosexism, what you, you name it, it's like the air that we breathe. Uh, and, and, and we know that there are certain certainly there are uh, communities and demographics that are benefiting 
in many ways from a system of ra a, a, a systemic national system of racism more than others. We, we cannot deny that. Um, but we but we have to be we have to remember that and Bev Tatum has this great example where she has this this she talks about you know being on the conveyor belt if you will or on the 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 walking path if you will in the airports for those of you um, who've been in an airport recently you you, you know you, you they have these these um, these walkways where on one side you can stand on the other side you can walk but whether you're standing or walking you are being carried in the same direction. And Bev Tatum would say, you're either a actively participating in the creation of these isms, or you're passively participating in sustaining them by your inability to witness yourselves from the inside out and your silence or non-action, if you will. So it, just because we're not actively doing things to create these unjust outcomes for people does not mean that we not, might not be passively and silently participating in sustaining and maintaining them. And so, I, I, so this notion of cultural humility for me is really about helping us seek more clarity from the inside out in our work with other people and helping us shift and situate ourselves as people, as human beings, first and foremost in our work and the vulnerability that, that brings, the limitations, the blind spots that that brings in situating ourselves in truly, truly helping other folks. I get this question a lot where people will ask, you know, can folks of color be racist? And so the question is, I, I, I sort of pose a question about can, can women be sexist? And sometimes women will say yes, but then I say, well, who benefits if women are are being discriminatory and oppressive to other women? And and inevitably it comes back to, well, me, we as men are benefiting. So then, therefore, is it called sexism? And if, if if within the definition of sexism and racism, there's power and there's privilege inherent in those, then can women be sexist? Can people of color be racist to one another? And the argument would be no, because when people of color are killing each other, that is maintaining and sustaining the already existing power structure and hierarchy and status quo. When women are being discriminatory and oppressive to each other, the patriarchal system continues to sustain and maintain its status unblemished and full force. So, so can we be prejudiced? Absolutely. Can women be prejudiced? Can can I, as a Mexican American, be prejudiced? Absolutely. Uh, but 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 that's different from this notion of what racism and sexism sexism may be. Im so implicit bias. I just want to speak a few minutes around implicit bias because here's the thing: people, I, I you know, sometimes I think people, folks, folks from different backgrounds will say, well. You know, look, I, I, I mean, I'm pretty conscious. Well, I'm conscious also, but I want to, I want to kind of remind us around this issue of implicit bias, which are these these subtle cognitive processes in some ways that often operate below our even our awareness, conscious awareness, and without intentional control. So it's our bias, our biases, if you will, that we may not even be aware of at times, or conscious of, yet they exist. They've done some neuroscience research looking at the medial prefrontal cortex and the amygdala, and and, and the we know that the the medial prefrontal cor cortex activates when we see someone as highly human. Likewise, it fails to activate activate when we dehumanize someone. The amygdala is where our integrated center for emotions lie, emotional behavior, motivation. Studies have shown that the amygdala activates when we feel fear, threat, anxiety, distrust. They've done, they did a study at, at Princeton where they um, showed folks images uh, and, of, of individuals, and while they were showing them Im images, they were uh, scanning their brains with a functional – through the process called the Functional Magnetic Resonance Imaging, fMRI. And so they, showed, they asked these participants to make judgments about people who were uh, socioeconomically disadvantaged, specifically homeless people, and then to make judgments about middle class people. Same was required for IV drug users versus non-drug users. All participants, and by the way, this was a diverse group of participants. All participants made judgments about middle class people 
uh, as participants made judgments about middle class people, their medial prefrontal cortex activated. In essence, they were encoding middle class people as human. When they were when they were asked to make the same judgments about homeless people, their medial prefrontal cortex was not fully activated. The same occurred when they were used, looking at IV drug users versus non-drug users. It was um, activated with non-drug users and not fully activated with IV drug users. So there's implications there. Uh, it's it, you know when people say I don't have biases or I don't you know see people in certain ways. Sometimes our behaviors may be in contradiction to what our stated values are. And so our, these reactions for these folks, which were surprising to many of them, were not intentional and perhaps even, um, you know, uncon that should be unconscious, not conscious, unconscious in their processes. And so, um, so I think uh, I want to bring us back to examining where we are located. And this notion of colorblind racial ideology. So here's how we have dealt with these issues in many ways, oftentimes. Um, CBRI is this denial of racial differences and racism by emphasizing that everyone is the same or has the same life opportunities. So it's really interesting to me because, you know, I, when, when you look at parenting practices um, and you look at, again, I don't want to generalize this to every parent of color or every white parent or parents, um, but it's this notion of when you look at parenting practices, there's been research that has looked at parenting practices with white parents and parenting practices with uh, parents of color. And the white parents, good, well-intentioned parents uh, have, have said, you know, they raise their children uh, to not see color, to not to not acknowledge, to not address these differences because they want to instill this notion that we're all the same. That we're all human beings and that, that you know that we shouldn't just focus on those issues who's going to argue with that right good well intention i think uh, in 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 that respect and then when you look at the parents of color they said look if i do not address these issues with my child if i am not consciously having conversations with them about what they're about to encounter in the world then i am not adequately preparing them to go out to the world and so you know Put these two pr perspectives side by side, and hence you see where our clash is. You see what happens as people uh, develop and unfold. You have some groups of people who are like, we shouldn't talk about it because it's not a good thing to talk about those things. We have other groups of folks who are like, we absolutely must talk about it. By not talking about it, you're not acknowledging and, and affirming aspects of my identity and my life that are very important and meaningful for me. And so this notion of colorblind racial ideology is problematic in, in some ways because it, it, it we, we know that um, that uh, that it, it, it challenges people. Some individuals may not may believe truly not discussing race advances racial harmony and equality by preventing people from being judged. Others, you know, um, don't want to be seen as, uh, as saying something offensive or being uh, labeled a racist. And I hear that continuously coming up. Uh, in conversations with people, especially today, um, and, and I hear people saying when someone says it's racist, it's kind of like a loaded, you put people in a position that they can, well, you know, that's a perspective, but we, you know, it's, it's people not wanting to examine their, their, their own, uh, what they're bringing to the conversation, if you will, at times. And, and so what I would say is, what I believe is, is that, you know, because you saw my social identities, Catholicism is huge for me. I believe that we are created equally, uh, but our life does not unfold the same uh, once we enter the world. And so, yes, um, we are created equal, but our life events and circumstances are not unfolding in the same way, thereby creating inequality, injustice, uh, and uh, and challenges in that way. And colorblindness, also, I think, um, you know, uh, people who may identify as white. Um, you know, may feel like, you know, feeling excluded in these conversations. Everybody has culture, including white individuals. And so our definition and our conversation should be inclusive of uh, including those individuals who may identify as white, whatever the background may be in our discussions. So we know that it impacts our work. Colorblind racial ideology impacts our work. Um, uh, we know that um, you know folks who are less aware of uh, how of their own racial identity development uh, and their racial colorblindness 
uh, maybe struggle to exhibit more multicultural competency in their practice. Um, uh, Burkhardt and Knox uh, did a study uh, several years ago and found that um, psychologists' empathy ratings of, cl of clients were lower when their racial colorblind attitudes were higher, regardless of the race of the client or presenting concern. Um, you know, other research has, has suggested that clients of color perceive the counseling alliance with their counselors as stronger when um, the, the, the therapist counselor is responsive to addressing racial concerns and, and their and background and their background uh, versus when race is ignored in the counseling process. Um, you know, and I think we, we you know, self-disclosure has been found to be, uh, you know, useful in, in therapy um, with uh, clients of color, et cetera. Um, I just have a few minutes left, so I'm going to move forward from this slide. Just want to briefly highlight a, a model that Mosher uh, developed and colleagues, uh, a cultural humility framework that they talk about. There's four aspects to it, uh, engaging in critical self-examination, building the therapeutic alliance, repairing cultural ruptures, and navigating value differences. You have more information in your slides than I'm covering today because I wanted you to have it there, um, but I think this certainly what I like about this framework is that it provides us with um, a, 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 some, some foundations to be thinking about our own capacities to capacity to facilitate and examine these issues, cultural issues, racial issues, oppression, discrimination in our work with individuals um, and, and how that impacts them and, and, and what we do. And so here's an example of you know, building the therapeutic alliance. You know, here's an example of, of the value differences and, you know, kind of repairing ruptures in, in therapy and um, sort of what we need to be thinking about with regards to that. So I, I, I think it's certainly a good foundation for us to be thinking about and it provides some some practical, I think, suggestions that can, that can be helpful for folks. So so as we think about sort of social justice, social issues, human issues, <clears throat> I want to revisit our practice framework. So. Prilatensky and colleagues have argued that wellness occurs in three different areas, personal, relational, and collective. They are all interconnected. One, just addressing one cannot compensate for the lack of the other or other two not being fully met and, and fully satisfied and fulfilled in the person's life. And so personal growth cannot outweigh societal factors affecting health. If we go back to wellness it, you know, and justice are intimately connected to each other. Here's a very sort of practical way of, of what that can look like in our work and what that means. Um, the, the issue is that, you know, m many forms of traditional mental health care focuses almost ex exclusively on this medical mental health personal piece on some ways. Obviously, there's some relational as well, um, but the focus centers on the individual. While the systemic issues, the collective issues, and the interactions uh, with the individual and the communities become background contextual uh, matters that are maybe overlooked, um, and, and ultimately, the, the, the Pacman would argue the very social issues that are relevant to the health and well-being are background noise and tend to be excluded as legitimate forms of professional intervention. He calls them, Pacman calls them second-class interventions. And we know that our Latinx families have multi-issues, medical, mental health, employment, uh, poverty maybe, immigration status, uh, you know, uh, trauma, uh, you name it. And, and so the, this notion of what it means to truly liberate folks and not that, again, even the language we use, we are not liberating anybody. We are simply walking with folks um, along side by side uh, to help them negotiate, navigate so that they can liberate themselves from the process. Uh, and so, you know, uh, this idea of uh, being a social justice practitioner, it's working, uh, you know, to develop collaborative relationships, to, to you know, address social societal trauma, power inequalities within the larger relationships within the larger society. Um, you know, how can we make healing and mental health services communities a process of liberation over a process of compliance to society's everyday oppressive practices. Uh, we, when we continue to reinforce this owners within the end, we are simultaneously supporting 
the reinforcement and ma of maintaining society's health status, status quo. That is that the problem is the evil. When we know that the problems for many of our community members are socially produced and socially derived, so then what is our responsibility to impact and to affect those societal larger contextual issues? Our healing process is now a community striving for healing versus one healer and one recipient. I have an example here of the cultural context model, which um, you have more information about. I'm not going to be able to go into that um, too, in too much detail today. So what does it mean? Well, it means we have to develop critical consciousness, which is you know, being aware of the socio-political context of daily life, viewing ourselves and being witnessed from the inside out. Uh, understanding everyday realities that we take for granted and how the world operates. An example, mental health service delivery systems are still deeply grounded in individualism. It doesn't fit. It's a mismatch for many of our communities. Um, this idea, Ferrari's idea of critical consciousness is, a dent, is, is essential to human rights uh, and social justice mental health providers because it illuminates this notion that a collective of people from diverse backgrounds can work towards communal healing as well as individual healing. Martin Bottle would say that psychological theories based on positive perspect positivist perspectives that is focusing only on what can be seen and measured leaves out all other possibilities contained in this person situation dynamic. A Latino male batter from a positivist perspective is simply machista, where it leaves, it's, it's narrow, it's too limited, it's an injustice to that individual and a disservice to our work. It leaves out the complexity of who they are, their essence, their being, and how historical, social, and economic factors affect his role someone who is responding to life and relationships. And, um, we need to take into consideration for many Latinx immigrants uh, the status in which society has placed us in addition to the culture of violence and oppression in our native cultures and also in, to the one in which we have arrived. What would, our, what would it look like to approach our work with the oppressed from strength-based perspectives? What would my work look like if I were more restricted? And the therapy counseling process through a liberatory lens shift our shifts our roles from expert to the role of process expert and what would that look like for you work in the community and a final uh, in la catch a la I and you are my other me this is an ancient mayan greeting which by the way was banned from the arizona education system because it, they believe that it was um uh in some ways creating this us versus them and empowering Latino communities too much, if you will. I don't hear that in this. You tell me what you think. Tu eres mi otro yo. You are my other me. Si te hago daño, if I do harm to you, me hago daño a mi me harm to myself. Si te amo, if I love and respect you, me amo y respeto, love and respect myself. Deep did. We are, we are uh, intimately connected and our reliance and dependence and to push forward beyond where we are now and to truly serve others relies on our ability to see ourselves from the inside out, see our connectedness and begin to heal uh, communities and help communities heal as we move forward. So last thing I'll mention, this is my information. If you'd like references, please let me know. I have on cultural humility. Uh, the address is there. Feel free to go look. I address a lot of these issues, uh, and uh, hopefully you you find this um, very expedient uh, presentation um, helpful. Thank you so much for attending. I know there were some people trying to attend, but it was at max capacity. So I'm thankful. I'm always feel honored when people attend and listen to uh, anything that I might have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gallardo, for an excellent presentation. Um, we have a few questions that we'd like for you to address. Um, one of them is, would you please expand on the meaning of interpersonal respect? Sure.
personal respect. Yeah, so that's on a slide that I didn't include in my presentation, right? It's, it's in one you sent them in the handout. Yes. I, I think. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So you know, this, this, this I, I, again, I think it's that that notion of you know seeing ourselves people. So so hard about uh, these issues. So like for example, I think our dialogues around these issues sometimes turn to debates, if you will. And, and so what's really hard is that um, it requires us to listen in many ways. And so I, I think when I think about interpersonal respect, I always tell people, look, I talk about these issues that, that I know people are not always agreeing with me. I, I know that when I go around the country and talk about these or on a webinar, wherever it may be, I know that there are people, but if, 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 if I am asking them to listen to me and I know that they may not agree with Aaron or disagree in some ways, I, sh I need to position myself to be able to listen to what they're trying to tell me. So it's not this yes, but it's more this and. So in other words, when I hear someone tell me something, I think a response may be, you know, listen to my perspective, listen to what this other person, in some way, yeah, but, you know, yours is not as relevant as mine, whereas opposed to, yes, I hear you, and there's also this other reality that might exist as well. If I, if I, if I show you that, if I understand that, then uh, what does that mean for how you may see things? So in, in around being able to, to, it may be things that we don't want to hear. That's just aspect of everything, but that's just an aspect of it. Okay. So we have a thank you for that. We have another question. We have a little bit of difficulty with the audio, so I apologize for that. But here's our second question. In terms of re-traumatization, sometimes people are not as aware of historical trauma effects. How would you address this? Uh, how would I address historical trauma in, in people? People yes. that, yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, I, I think part of it is also helping people People understand how they have come to see the world in which they do. So this, even this process of, of liberation psychology it is really in some ways sort of facilitating a process by which we help people understand uh, the lens or the multiple lens in which they have come to understand themselves, their experiences, and, and also the context in which they find themselves, which, which, which sometimes you know, uh, people may not have, have fully uh, necessarily in some way. So I, I think sometimes when I, when I work with, uh, you know, immigrant Latinx community members, they're, they're giving me languages that I, that, 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 that internalized external tools sometimes may not necessarily even reflect entirely their own realities. So I think part of it is, is inquiring, asking questions, learning, but also trying to help puzzles together. You know, this notion of removing the the uh, the limitations or people remove limitations and 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 the chains and the the from their minds in some ways. I think is also freeing them from some of those health traumas have impacted their lives in some ways. Sometimes they, they may not even be aware of how that has been in their relationships. I make an assumption that all behavior is purposeful. And if I make that assumption, it's important for me to understand what purpose or serve for the individual. Sometimes people tell me I'm busy when I ask them those questions, like what What are you getting out of continuing to do this? Like if we go back to the male batterer and I say, what purpose does that serve for you? What do you get out of that? He may look at me like I, I'm absolutely crazy, but if he was, if it was not serving some purpose for him, he would not continue to do it. It doesn't mean it's helpful. It mean we want him to keep doing it, but how can I help him understand what purpose that serves, how it's protected for him, whatever it may be, and where that has come from? And sometimes that's connected to some of those historical experiences and they've experienced that they may not even have connected 
what their current, if you will. And so I, I don't patholo- I don't. I come at this from a very non-pathological perspective. I do not pathologize people in their responses and in their. Re- I try to affirm and and validate and validate and affirm before I start to question and challenge and 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 help them see things differently. Because again, again, if we're talking about someone in danger. <clears throat> very different situation. I might respond differently. It's a crisis. But if we're talking about, you know, um, verbal r- responses or ch- challenges in relation, but I think, you know, I have to intervene to, 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 to stop a behavior from responding. I might respond in that particular way. If it's, it's something more immediate, then obviously I want to stop and make sure that people are safe um, in just that example. So I don't, I don't know if that's helpful, but uh, just off the top of my head, that's that's uh, some things I was thinking about. Thank you. Thank you so much. So sure. we don't have time for more questions. We actually do have a few more um, that maybe can email those to me if they want to. My email is on the last slide, and I'm happy to respond. Okay. Or I can email them to you as well. Okay. Um, okay. Sounds good. Perfect. So again, thank you, Dr. Gallardo. Um, thank you. We truly appreciate you taking the time to do the webinar and also we appreciate our participants taking the time uh, to attend as they leave the webinar today. As you leave the webinar today, you will be redirected to complete a brief survey. So please stay tuned and remember that we offer training and technical assistance on similar subjects. So if you're interested, you can visit our website to find out more. So thank you, everybody.